On the phone, we have legendary NBA coach Dick Mata, former coach of the Chicago Bulls, Washington Bullets, Dallas Mavericks. How are you doing, Mr. Mata? Good, good. Real good. How are you doing? Great. So you started out coaching, uh, what, in college at Utah State? Oh, no, no. I, I started uh, I started uh, coaching and teaching in the seventh grade uh, in uh, Grace, Idaho. I... Uh, I had I had seventh grade students all day long. I coached the the junior high basketball and track, and then I was the assistant football and basketball coach at the high school after school. Then I was also the head baseball coach at the high school. Uh, Phil Johnson, I don't know if you remember him. He used to coach in the sure. league a couple of years ago. He was in right. my first seventh grade class. He was the coach of the really Sacramento grade. Kings, if I recall. Yeah, he he. Uh, that was his. That was his last legitimate job. After that, then he went over and stole the money uh, from the Jazz. So how do you get from coaching seventh grade to coaching in the NBA? Well, I I had a commission in the Air Force, and I went in the Air Force. I did my, I did my duty for my country and uh, uh, came home. And uh, in the meantime, the uh, both jobs had opened up at the high school in Grace, Idaho. And uh, uh, I'd been in touch with the superintendent during my two-year stint, and uh, both jobs were open. I, uh, and he gave me my choice of being the football coach or the, the basketball coach. And uh, I, I really liked football a lot better, but up in that area, they had the spud vacation, the potato vacation for two weeks in the fall, and they'd never won a football game after the spud vacation because the <laughs> kids tied up their muscles and everything. And uh, and then it snowed a lot, and you had to the football coach had to always organize to get the the snow off the field and the lines drawn and and everything. And it got, got to be a, a hassle when I was there in the junior high. I had to help too, and they just built a new gym, and the lines were already on the on the floor. So I took basketball. Smart choice. You wanted to yeah. Well, I, I don't know. I, I think it was. I, I uh, as it turned out, it was it was a smart choice. But I still uh, was the assistant. Uh, you know, it was a small school. We had 140 kids in the uh, in the in the top three grades uh, of the high school, and uh, I was the uh, uh, I was the backfield coach in football. And uh, I had the basketball. Then I then I also coached in the spring. I coached the baseball, and I did that for uh, three three years. The last the last uh, two years, uh, the year before I left, we were 24 and two and lost in the state championship. And the last year, we were 24 and two and uh, won the state championship. But then I uh, I applied for a couple of jobs. Uh, and didn't get them, so I went back to uh, college for a year and got my master's degree and worked with Jim Williams as a graduate assistant at Colorado State. And then uh, uh, the Weber Junior College job opened, and uh, and I, and I took I took the the junior college job, and uh, and I uh, I stayed there. Uh, it was a junior college for two years. We knew this going in, and then it moved into a uh, was going to go into a four four year institution. So I, I I took the junior college for two years, and then I, I was it was a three year uh, college one year. And then the next year we graduated students. So I look back on it and I coached. I've had experience in the junior high, the high school, the military. I coached a team in the Air Force, uh, uh, junior college, uh, a four year school, and then uh, you know we made the. My teams at Weaver really did well, and uh, we we uh, made the uh, NCAA tournament that year when we were in the Sweet 16 when the Sweet 16 was just getting in. <laughs> there were only 16 teams uh, allowed there. So we, we were playing a team at home uh, by the name uh, of Pan American University, and they had a they had a kid by the name of Otto Moore who was projected to be the number one draft choice. And Dick Klein from Chicago came out to watch that game. Uh, my center, Dan Sparks, who later played in the ABA, kicked uh, Otto's butt. We won by 40, and uh, uh, 
somehow I guess Klein was was kind of impressed with the with our team and that March he c- called me and offered me the job in uh, in Chicago. Do you think that could ever happen again where someone who never played in high school, college, or pro basketball could become an NBA coach? Well, and, and the, the first NBA game I saw in person, you know, I saw a couple on television, but the first the first one I saw in person was the was the game I coached. It was, it was the New York Knicks on the road, and we stayed across the street uh, at the old uh, uh, New Yorker. It was called. I think it's demolished now, but uh, all the players went over early with their uh, pillowcases and stuff, and. Uh, I went a little later, and I went to the press gate, which was right there, and and then I told the guy that I'm. He said, well, "You don't have a ticket." And I said, "No, I'm the coach of Chicago Bulls," and he said, "Yeah, and I'm president of the United States." <laughs> and uh, the smart ass wouldn't let me in. And a guy by the name of Lenny Lewin had interviewed me that earlier in the day over at the hotel, and he verified for me. So I got to see my first game on the recommendation of a, 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 I think he worked for the New York Times. I'm not sure, one of the New York papers. So I, I, I was in, man. I got into the game, and we won it. And uh, uh, and then we went over to Milwaukee the very next night and won it. I called Phil, who had taken my job. Uh, he played for me, and I'd hired him at Weber. Then he he took my job at Weber. I called him and said, hell, there's nothing in this NBA. We're 2-0, and we, we don't have a good team. I left a better team back in, in Weber. And uh, the next night, we played at home against uh, Bill Russell. Ooh. Holy shit, he got me. He got me good. He, he, <laughs> he, they, they won by like 63 points. And so I, I came back to reality right away, and I knew that, that uh, I had made a terrible mistake by accepting that job. Well, life's full of challenges, and that, that certainly sounds like it was one of them. Of course, going up against the Celtics in those days, Red Arbach probably oh, was yeah, lighting yeah, up the it, cigar it, in the third quarter. Well, it was great because I had uh, only seen Bill Russell on television, and uh, and he's he's a lot better in person. You know, it was, I got I got a really neat seat to watch uh, Bill Russell and uh, Will Chamberlain and Oscar Robertson and Jerry West. Uh, you know, I, I I had a seat that was free for almost forty years. But you developed a pretty good Bulls team there when you had uh, Norm Van Leer, Jerry Sloan, Walker Love, and Borwinkle. That was a, uh, a a really good team. Uh, we, you know, I made this uh, statement. Phil Johnson was down here visiting me the other day, and uh, I said that that team came to play every day. You know, as a coach, what you what you want to walk out that dressing room and you want to know what you're going to get. There are very few teams. There are very few coaches that that have that uh, that warm feeling. That uh, we played we played as hard. Uh, two days before Christmas in New Orleans, as we did against the, in the seventh game against the Lakers, uh, I knew every every game that we were going to be consistent. Jerry Sloan, Van Leer, uh, we had a uh, really good team, but we were not quite good enough to beat Jabbar, or at that time Wilt, uh, Jerry West. Uh, Elgin Baylor, you know, they, they were, sometimes you, you just get beat by a, a better person. Uh, and I always just developed a theory, and, and, and I could live with it, is that I hated – I didn't mind getting beat. I, I didn't mind getting – I got a lot of scars to prove that uh, I got the heck kicked out of me by bigger and better people sometimes. But I, 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 I couldn't stand losing – I didn't mind getting beat, but I hated to be dumb and lose games. And the players, that Chicago team, on a, on a consistent day in, day out, they 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 got beat once in a while, but they didn't lose games. Now, does the coach get credit for the players playing hard, or is that something that's inside the players themselves? Is it a combination? Well, I, I always said, someone told me one time that a, that a coach in the NBA is only worth about 10%. And I said, well, that's great because most games are, uh, there's a six point swing on the history of, of, of a decent game. Uh, I don't know if coach is important or not. Ask that Taba guy or someone at the, down at the, the 49ers. Do you, do you think, let me ask you, do you think that's coaching or do you think that 
that just that's the, the alignment of the stars. I think it's the coaching because we talked to Roger Craig, who was a former 49er, and he said that mentality of the 49ers changed after Singletary was fired and Harbaugh took over. Sure. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I used to have an ego enough that, uh, you know, I knew that, uh, that uh, I, I, I talked to a, there's a sports psychiatrist that's a really good friend of mine. Uh, he teaches at Utah State, and we're having, we have we, every every seven o'clock a lot of days we get together with the professors and stuff and I ask him about turning points when when is there a turning point in a career whether it be in coaching or medicine or law or something even in broadcasting when was the time that turning point that you realized that you belonged you know everyone has one and it's it's an interesting subject a lot of a lot of, uh, of Coaches, particularly in this day and age, don't don't pay the price that I did. I don't wear it on my chest and brag about it, but uh, uh, there are a lot of guys that never picked up the jocks, didn't drive the bus, didn't do the laundry, didn't meet the parents, didn't teach the classes, uh, didn't organize the booster club. Uh, you know, a lot of a lot of things that went into into my background that I'm really proud of. I think the thing that I'm the most proud of, and if we're into things now, uh, the the day after, uh, the weekend after Labor Day, uh, we'll have our our reunion with my high school team that won the state championship. We were honored a few years ago as a legend team in in Idaho. We went we went 48, 48 and and four the last two years, and. Uh, all of those kids, but one graduated from college. We lost one in in Vietnam, but every year, every every other year, they gather at our place. Fifteen kids have played for me, fourteen ever alive, and thirteen of the wives come. And we spend a weekend together, and we have we have a uh, reunion. And that's probably the thing that I'm the most proud of in in all of my athletic accomplishments. I hope you invite the managers because I was a manager at Loyola University in high school, <laughs> and a lot of the managers are forgotten. Forgotten what? They forget the managers, a lot of coaches. They don't consider don't, the managers part of the team. My manager is always – my manager was always included, and he comes to it. His name is Mark Thomas. He was a manager in uh, high school for for uh, three years for me. And he, he and his wife come. They they live up in uh, Oregon, in Portland. And they come every year, every every other year. We have it. I give you credit for that because, I mean, they're the forgotten manager? Guys. I was a manager in yeah. high school and in Loyola at Division One. That's great. You know that uh, probably I didn't have an assistant. I didn't have assistant coaches for uh, all through uh, high school and the first four years at Weaver, and for the first four years uh, in the NBA, I didn't have an assistant coach. And and, and the NBA was my trainer. Uh, that, that was my uh, was the liaison between me and you know me being a jerk and those those players trying to understand me. He was always the conduit, and the same thing with my uh, my trainer, or, or my manager. And I, I, I bet you can look back on the uh, numerous situations where you you save uh, you you save some tranquility for the ball club, either between players or between the players and the coach. No, exactly. And then you went on to coach at Dallas, and you had some personalities there with Mark Aguirre. Well, I've had. Uh, I've had some. I've had some challenges. Every every coach does, you know. I don't have too much. I don't have too much trouble uh, with individuality because I'm 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 basically different too. And I, I I just let them know that I work really hard to get where I am. Don't embarrass me. And I'll be as a coach. I'll be what the players make me be. I'll be your best friend. I'll be a policeman. I I won't change their diaper and I won't burp them. Those are the two. <laughs> those are the two uh, areas that I that I won't get into. Now, when I think of Dick Mata, I think of some fairly wild sport coats. Do you still have those? Oh gosh, I I, I don't anymore. I I still got that one that I threw over Murphy's head. That plaid one was on Easter Sunday, and it was a was plaid, and it was, was polyester. Oh hell, I was so proud of that. Had uh, there was a plaid one, a yellow, and all the all the uh, uh, autumn uh, hues to it. And 
I still have that. Uh, I'm, one of these days, I'm going to get it stuffed. I'll probably, <laughs> I'll put a, put, probably put it on when, when they put me in the crematorium. <laughs> when you left the Bulls to coach the Bullets, what was the reason that you went to the Bullets? I, it was a job. I had never gone to a team in any 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 job, and, and all of my jobs, I went to teams that were were absolutely struggling. But I just in the back of my mind, I said, "What what would it be like to go and uh, coach a team that has, you know, you knew that Wes and Elvin were going to be on the All Star team or and, and the Hall of Fame." And so could I uh, get a guy from Union, Utah? You know, how, how would how would they how would it be if they would they accept it? it was it was more it was more of a uh, an experiment for me uh, about me uh, to see if if, uh, if I could get people like that to to respond. And it was interesting. Yeah. It was an established now, team. They they were expected to win, and and we did win. Could you win with Wes Unseld at center today, do you think? Excuse me? Do you think you could win an NBA championship with Wes Unseld at center today? There aren't any centers today. <laughs> it was, they, come down, they come down to face that Hereford, <laughs> they, they'd make a U-turn. Not, they, not too many back-to-the-basket oh, players. Oh, all he'd have to do is lower his, his head like those, those bulls do in the bull ring. Lower his head a little bit and raise his eyes and look at him. They would have shin splints. <laughs> they'd have to take they'd have to take two or three days off, you know, just to get just to rest, just to get just to get rested. Those had to be some pretty good practices. When you, did you ever have West Unsell go against Elvin Hayes? Did I watch him in practice every day? Did they go against each other one on one? Oh, not often. Once in a we didn't do one on one stuff much. Uh, uh, totally different personalities. Uh, totally opposite uh, in, in basically their philosophies, but they put it together when they stepped out on the floor. To answer you your question, would, the, the, would would Jerry West transcend to today's? Uh, game would have a check uh the answer is yes the, there are there, there the, some of the players now are there there's no question that they they are a little more athletic and athleticism seems to be you know the the, the thing is more stress on stuffing the ball and blocking it than, than setting a screen and, and running a play you know that it's a little bit different but yes the, the players uh, how, how long did Matt I bet you Magic Johnson could go out there today and hold his own against some of the players in this league. Carl Malone, they, they went through they went through three two generations. The 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 the, the talent will transcend. It, it does. The great players then uh, would certainly do good now. When when I went into the league, there were only ten teams. We we said we had three good centers and. Uh, Five great point guards. Uh, Fifty years, forty years later, thirty-two, thirty-three teams. I don't know how many are. There's still five good point guards, and there aren't three great centers. How did the saying "the opera isn't over till the fat lady sings" start? Oh, that was stupid. <laughs> I'd heard that. Uh, was well, the original one was uh, the rodeo ain't over till they ride the Brahma, and we were we were ahead of. Uh, Philadelphia three, three to one, but we had to go up to their place. And the, this cub reporter just kept at it and at it and at it. What does it feel like to, to finally play for a world championship? Play for a world championship. And I couldn't get rid of him. And I said, hey, man, it's like it's like this operating over till the fat lady sings. I don't know why I said it. my. I came. Home, they had 18 cameras in my face, and it got to be a. a it got big. I still see it quoted. Um, my wife came. I came home and my wife said, "You know, you said some really dumb things, but that's the most stupid thing." And every every fat person in the world is going to be 
teed off at you. But it got to be our battle cry, and I still live with it. You ever go to the opera? Not a fat. I had a chance. I had. I had it. I had it. Uh, it was invited to the Metal- Metropolitan Opera, and I went down to the Grand Old Opry in te- uh, <laughs> with uh, Howard Baker. I looked like Howard Baker, and he wanted me to come down. And uh, he was running for president, and he wanted me to put on a coonskin hat and pretend that I was, I was Howard Baker, and invited me to the uh, Grand Old Opry. I'm not sophisticated enough to go to the one in New York. <laughs> Well, I don't know about that. Now, if you had to put together a starting five of the players you coached, who who might be in that lineup? Oh, I don't know. I, I've 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 had some I've had some great players. It's, uh, I, you know, you have some of your favorites, and you you might leave some out. Uh, I had an all-star team once that I would like to have coached, and uh, Michael Jordan and Magic Johnson were the guards, and Jabbar was the center. Uh, I, I would have a hard time leaving Larry Bird uh, off that team. Uh, I, I would probably have Larry Bird at one forward and uh, um, and Bill Russell at the uh, other forward. I, I would just tell Bill, don't shoot. <laughs> we'll, we'll, Magic, Magic, and uh, uh, J- uh, Michael and and Larry Bird can do the shooting once in a while. If you get bored, pass it into Jabbar and he can score. But Bill, don't don't you dare shoot the ball. You go get it. You know, if if they've got the ball, you go get it back. And that would be a hard team to beat. But you could you could pick three other teams that would, would do just as well. Yeah. <laughs> of the players that you coached, uh, you know, had on your own teams, is there a five you could come up with? Oh yeah, I, I'd like to have. Uh, I, you know, I, I would I would have. Uh, I've had, you know, it's, that's hard to do that. You know, you have, you have Rolando Blackman and uh, uh, Sam Perkins. You had uh, Mitch Kupchak, uh, Elvin Hayes, Bobby Dandridge would definitely be on my All Star team. There's, there's one fellow, and, and I've coached around long enough, and I've been around uh, great players, and Bobby Dandridge would hold his own against any of them. And I, and I hope that one day people won't hold a prejudice against him. He he was not, he's he's not a politician. Uh, he 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 played with two fellows in the uh, that are in the Hall of Fame, and he certainly deserves to be. And he he would definitely be my. I, I would probably play him today as as a as an off guard. I'll tell you one thing. I used to watch when you coach the Mavericks. I love the Mavericks, but what used to drive me crazy was you always starting Brad Davis. I'm like. Put in Derek Harper from Illinois, but you love Brad Davis and he got the job done. Well, I it, it, Harper came in. He was a you know I love Harper. He, I, I tease him all the time. I, I I think that one of the one of the neatest things that I did is that I I started Brad Davis ahead of him, and it used to drive him nuts. He would work <laughs> ten times harder in practice, and he was better. I remember that one day uh, we walked in. The, the dressing room and I, we were just getting ready for the meeting and I said to, to Brad, it's time. And he nodded and I started, uh, I started Harper in his place. And Brad came off the bench and there's many, 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 many games where uh, Brad Davis finished the game. You don't have to start it to be, a, you know, for your ego, uh, but you have to finish it to win sometimes. What do you th- this is not an interview. This is more like a book. Hell, you're not <laughs> going to broadcast this stuff. Uh, we we did a half hour with uh, John Condo. He was amazing. We did a half hour last week with um, Joe Garagiola, and he was just phenomenal with these stories. <laughs> with baseball. Well, you, can't, you, can't, you can't write a book because you would embarrass people. <laughs> last question. I would, I what do you think it, about, I do it anyway. What do you think about being a finalist for the Hall of Fame? I, I was last year, wasn't I? You were last year and again this year. I haven't heard a word about it. Would you? I, is I would, that uh, something that, that that you want? That you, you know, some people, live, you know, in Chicago, Ron Santo was hoping in his lifetime to make it into the Baseball Hall of Fame, and that didn't happen. Do you think much about I'm the in, Hall of Fame? Well, I, I'm... I'm in about four Hall of Fames. Uh, 
the, my favorite Hall of Fame, and I'm not kidding, is at uh, uh, Bear Lake West. That's the resort where uh, it's a, the golf course up there next to us, and we got uh, our, there. Pitch, there's four guys in there in the Hall of Fame at the at the Bear Lake uh, Bar and Lounge and restaurant. Merlin Olson, Phil Johnson, Bob Bentley, and myself. And that that's uh, has, that's as great a Hall of Fame as you could ever hope for. I was going to say that's we're a pretty all good native. We're all, we all we all live there. <laughs> we're all we're all natives. We lost Merlin uh, two years ago. Right. That was just that was a bad one. But uh, I'm I, I, look. I I turn off, and this is the God's truth. My wife was watching American Idol last night, and I turned it off. Uh, and I and I said, you know, uh, those people relish in watching those contestants suffer. They they love it if they can get them to cry. Oh, if they can get them to cry and the tear jerk and get the get the emotion, and they have the power, they say, but you didn't make it. Try again next year. Well, any kid that went to the door and looked up on the list and his name wasn't there on a cut, and this happened to me. This happened to me my senior year of high school. I knew I was going to make the team. And the coach was chicken shit enough to post it on a, on a, on the bulletin board. And I read that, that my name wasn't on there, and it affected my life. And do uh, you think I'm going to make any change in my personality to get into a damn Hall of Fame? I know who I am, and I know what I did. And uh, I, I'm certainly not going to. Uh, I'm certainly not going to campaign, and I didn't know that I, I knew that I was in the finals last year, but there's an article that I could send to you. Uh, some guy asked me 25 years ago if uh, I'd make the Hall of Fame, and I said, there's no way. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't play the game. You know, I didn't, I didn't butter up. I, I, didn't, I, I didn't campaign for it. And if my daughter is a my daughter's a beautiful girl, and I would not let her enter Miss America or a, a beauty contest because it's not fair that other people judge my daughter. And it and it doesn't. And I I hate it when a sports writer can judge me whether I was a good enough coach or not. I mean that's how I feel. I'm sorry, but that's how, that's how I really feel. If I make it, I make it. And I'll be as happy as tickled, not as as much as my kids, because they would they would think they think that their old man belongs in there. But my record, I I, I don't have a 500 record. Why would they vote me in there? They want they want beauty. Thank and you. I don't, and I resent that other people judge how I coached. Does that make sense to you? Total sense. Definitely. What's that? Total sense. Yeah. 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 And that's I didn't know that I was in the, uh, I was in the running this year. You're in the finals. It, it, the veterans committee what? put Chet Walker in, and uh, Sam Smith's going in as a writer, and Pat Williams is going in. I think. Now, when you say going in, they've they've been accepted. They've been accepted, and you're part of the uh, finalists right now that they're yeah. going to announce that they, uh, I believe, the but final. Those, four. those are di- those are different categories. I think you know Sam Smith gets in as a writer and. Uh, Chet Walker gets yeah, in for, yeah. for something else, and uh, Pat Williams gets in for something else. Uh, well, I still that, both that both. Okay. Chet Walker isn't in as a player. He's going in this year as a player. As a player, yes, by the oh, by good. the veteran committee. He was going in for uh, for something. Uh, I, I misunderstood you. No problem. Thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, he deserves. For time. He he. I'll tell you what. Chet the Jet, boy, they didn't come much better than him. No, they didn't. They didn't. I'm I'm serious. He uh, he was uh, he was a pro's pro. I, I think that's a, probably as good a compliment as I could ever give a guy. He was a pro's pro. He came every day. I remember one time he, we were on the bus about four in the morning. We had to catch an early flight. We'd put, we'd been playing in uh, uh, it was it was a uh, exhibition game. We'd been we were playing in. Uh, Omaha, and the bus left at uh, six o'clock in the morning. And Chet was always there at fifteen two, and my my watch is always set ten minutes ahead. And here comes Jimmy Collins, first round draft choice. His 
his shirt hanging out of his of his pants. His his uh, suitcase is about half done. Chet was there reading the paper. He looked down over his eyes, spread the paper out, looked down over his eyes, looked up at Jimmy Carr and said, hey, Rook, pack before you go to bed. <laughs> and the kid never was late again. Thank you That's for leadership. Chet Walker. Thank you so much for coming It was a pleasure talking to you. Yeah. Separate the bull from the rest of it, okay? Okay. If, if, if nothing more... <laughs> If nothing more, every junior high, if I, if I did one thing and could convey one message in my life, every junior high coach out there, every, every assistant high school coach, every guy that that's, can't wait to get out, go to the next clinic, drive halfway across the country to hear a good coach and read every damn book they can find and just love the game. If, if I could be an inspiration to those guys and say, keep it up, Boy, I, I, I would be that'd be much better than any other any other thing that I could accomplish in my life, because you know there are guys out there that that are really really good and they just don't sometimes just don't get the breakthrough. Exactly. Thank you again for your time. Oh,